Splatoon has seen its fair share of changes, with almost 80 different patches released over the last 8 years that have altered the game in some meaningful way. There have been many cases of good changes to Splatoon games that have made them much healthier and more balanced, but there are also some changes that have been far too drastic. It's often the case that these overdone patches are turned around on and slowly fixed, but the weapon we're talking about today did not get the same treatment. Once considered to be extremely powerful, and maybe even the best weapon in the entire game, this weapon suffered some of the biggest nerfs in all of Splatoon, only to be never touched again by the developers. That's right, today's video is on the Range Blaster, a weapon that has not received a single multiplayer balance change since it was practically killed 72 months ago, but despite that, is still beloved by the community at large and is still used competitively. Why was this weapon so good? Why did Nintendo nerf it so harshly? What's holding it back from being good again? And most of all, why has Nintendo essentially ignored it? All of these questions and more will be answered as this is the history of the Range Blaster. Before we get into the details on the weapon itself, I want to give a massive thanks to Range Blaster expert and YouTuber ProChara for helping me out with this video. Chara has played Range Blaster competitively at or near the highest level for a very long time, and he was able to answer the large number of questions I had lined up about this weapon's history. He is largely responsible for the absurd amount of Range Blaster players in Splatoon, and is a massive inspiration to many of us in the community. So thanks again to Chara, go check him out if you haven't already, and let's get back into the video. Range Blaster is part of the Blaster Weapon class, known for their very unique projectile which looks like this. The blaster shot travels a set distance before exploding, creating a large blast radius which deals good damage. These shots also have the ability to direct hit, which will instantly kill the opponent. And although direct hits are significantly harder to land, the reward you get out of hitting them is very much worth it. This projectile type is pretty powerful, and blasters tend to have amazing aggressive capabilities because of it, but in exchange, Blasters always paint and charge special pretty poorly, making it risky to run more than one of them on your team at a time. Range Blaster, for the most part, is a very simple weapon. It's almost exactly like the regular blaster in behavior, but it has longer range, and this longer range is balanced out by a slower fire rate and overall more downtime compared to its shorter range counterpart. Like the other one-shot blasters, range is very fight-oriented and aggressive, with its AoE damage from the explosion enabling it to hit many more angles than other weapons in the game can. It can hit people behind cover, above a ledge, below a ledge, you get the idea. Pretty much anywhere the blast radius can reach, Range Blaster can threaten. On top of this, Range Blaster's longer range allows it to use its AoE abilities and its quick one-shot from a safe distance, meaning it can output a lot of pressure while staying relatively safe at the same time. This makes it a somewhat rare case in Splatoon, being one of the few purely aggressive mid-range weapons found in the game. This might sound great on its own, but of course, the weapon doesn't come without its downsides. I mentioned range's downtime before, and all this extra lag the weapon has really, really hurts it. Its slow fire rate, lots of whiting frames, bad strafe speed, heavy ink consumption, and long time after firing before it can do something else all come together to create a really slow weapon. And with range wanting to do nothing else but fight in a fast-paced game like Splatoon, this really hurts it. All of this makes the main weapon really exploitable, especially in a coordinated setting, as it can be hard to engage confidently with how much lag the weapon has. This isn't even the worst thing about range though, as it suffers the most from jump RNG, a mechanic that almost all blasters suffer from and have to deal with. When standing on the ground, blaster shots will travel exactly where you aim them with perfect accuracy, but when you jump, they can deviate heavily, with a difference of up to 8 degrees on range blaster. And since the shots travel very far, this deviation can cause you to land an indirect hit instead of what should have been a direct hit, or even cause you to miss entirely. You may think that this can be avoided by just not jumping, which is partially true, but jumping is super important for this weapon's offense, and without it, your movement is obviously severely limited, which just makes Range Blaster even more exploitable. The obvious weaknesses of the main weapon definitely hurt it, and are a large part of why Range Blaster is heavily dependent on its kit to succeed. The main weapon on its own is not very good, but when paired with a strong sub and special that works well with it, Range Blaster becomes so much better instantly. The unfortunate thing about this kit dependency is that you can't just give Range Blaster anything good and expect it to work well. It wants to work around and with its entire kit, and it especially benefits from kits which lean further into aggression, like giving it more movement and combo opportunities. On top of this, Range can't do too much outside of fighting, so if it gets a supportive kit, it's not really going to do well. To further invest into its aggression, Range Blaster's best ability across all three games is Quick Respawn, also known as QR, and it's so good for it that it becomes Range Blaster's global gear dependency. Practically every Range Blaster wants to be running Quick Respawn. It doesn't really need to run anything else besides QR, Stealth Jump, and the Essential Subs in Splatoon 2 and 3, 
so it mostly just sticks with QR and fits whatever else it wants on there afterwards. Overall, range is a weapon with really prominent strengths and an extremely aggressive playstyle that, when played to, can be very good. But the even more prominent weaknesses of the weapon will always balance this out, holding Range Blaster back from being overbearing due to how extreme the strong parts about it are. Despite the negatives I've presented so far, many of you probably know that Range Blaster was actually really good in Splatoon 1. Why was that? Well, we'll have to go back there to find out. In Splatoon 1, Range Blaster was generally a stronger main weapon, as a lot of the downsides I mentioned earlier were either less severe or non-existent back then. It had less downtime overall, with things like less ink consumption, less whiting frames, and slightly better paint, but more than any of that was Range Blaster having significantly better accuracy while jumping. It still wasn't perfect, as the shots do deviate from the reticle, but it was much better than it would be in later games. On top of this, blasters at the start of Splatoon 1 were insanely powerful. Today, all of the one-shot blasters have a max explosion damage of 70, but for a while in the first game, the indirect hits could do up to 125 damage, meaning this massive blast radius could one-shot anybody, especially when you stack damage up on your gear, which makes it even easier to hit. This would be patched out in a later update, but before it was patched, Range Blaster must have been pretty insane, right? Well, yes and no. Obviously, the main weapon being able to one-shot you like that is crazy, but the other two blasters in the game at the time, Regular Blaster and Luna Blaster, could one-shot with the blast radius as well, were easier to pick up, already existed before Range Blaster, and had a larger blast radius at the time. On top of Range Blaster being a generally harder main weapon to play, Reg Blast and Luna were given pretty okay kits, whereas Range got Splash Wall and Ink Strike, a kit that doesn't really work with it. Splash Wall isn't great for this weapon, as Range can't get too much value out of playing around its wall as opposed to something like 96 Gal Deco, and Ink Strike forcing it to play further back to use its special safely is not good for Range whatsoever. As we mentioned before, it wants to go in and get kills, and without the extra options to help it get kills, it really struggles as a weapon and feels pretty awkward to play. Also, the aforementioned 96 Gal Deco pretty much does exactly what Vanilla Range wanted to do, but much better thanks to its kit of Splash Wall and Kraken. 96 Deco can get much more value out of its wall, having a much higher fire rate and a two-shot, and Kraken is an incredibly strong fighting option as well as a way to keep yourself alive, which Range Blaster's kit completely lacks. In short, there's not really a reason for Vanilla Range Blaster to be picked. The players at the time didn't see it being used over blasters already present in the game, and its kit kinda sucks anyways. Of course, Vanilla Range is only one of three different range blasters in this game, and while it didn't give the greatest first impression, the next two would make up for its shortcomings many times over. This is the custom range blaster, equipped with Splat Bomb and Kraken, and if you know anything about Splatoon 1, this thing is insane. It easily became a contender for the best weapon in the entire game, and is known for just how broken it was. But something not too many people know is that it wasn't immediately seen as the best weapon in the game, despite having one of the best kits. Custom range actually wasn't very considered, and was pretty uncommon in the earlier times of the game. It never really took off until the endgame started developing, and before then was still seen as a pretty good weapon, but nothing crazy by most standards. There were definitely prominent players running it, and it was good, but most didn't really consider it over other meta standards at the time despite having an incredible kit. So, what changed? Well, in order for it to be considered over meta standards, the meta was going to have to change, and it did just that at the end of the game's lifespan. As you probably know, Quick Respawn, Stealth Jump, and Invincibility Specials quickly took over Splatoon 1 as soon as people began to realize how good they were, which players had expected to happen with the development of this new meta in the Japanese scene. What people weren't expecting, however, was for CRB to be the perfect weapon for this new meta game, and when I say perfect, I mean it. Custom Range Blaster has its fast and long range direct, a fast lethal bomb which can also serve as a combo tool, amazing AoE utility, and of course, to top it all off, a light depletion kraken, the best special in the entire game. Basically, it was an incredibly strong slayer with super fast kill options, and it was absolutely the best at what it does. Nothing else in this game really comes close to competing with CRB's role as a slayer, and this dominance only truly revealed itself when the game became practically perfect for it, as slower kill options began to get worse and worse with how fast people were respawning in that game. It was so good that, despite being a blaster, double CRB was an actual strategy, which, for blasters, is completely unheard of today. Most competitive teams don't even think of running two blasters at once, but because custom range is, well, custom range, the sheer killing power of the weapon was plenty enough to make up for it. 
In a game pretty much overrun by quick respawn, meaning almost everybody gets back into the fight super fast, having three incredibly strong and fast one-shot options as well as a way to make yourself invincible is what truly sets this weapon apart. Not only did it have what was pretty much the best kit for this meta, but it already wanted to run quick respawn, so instead of having to switch off its preferred gear builds like other weapons did, it just stacked more QR instead. Despite how powerful it is, CRB is a pretty healthy weapon to be the best in the game, as it's very strong but by no means impossible to deal with, and is also a pretty hard weapon to get good at. Custom Range Blaster is a large part of why people look back on Splatoon 1's endgame fondly, despite how broken it was, and CRB certainly frontruns a much healthier meta than some of what we would see in later games. While not being quite as good as endgame CRB, the next part of Range's legacy is still very important, and in my opinion, is one of the coolest looking weapons ever brought into the game. With one of the most iconic designs in all of Splatoon, this is the Grim Range Blaster, which comes with a burst bomb and light depletion killer whale. This was actually the more commonly seen Range Blaster until Splatoon 1's endgame, and while likely not being seen as better at the time, it was definitely more accessible and easy to understand, largely thanks to Burst Bomb. As you probably know, Burst Bomb is a very good sub, instantly exploding and dealing damage upon contact with anything, and it works super well with Range Blaster because of this property. Range on its own can't move too well, and Burst being one of the best movement options in the game helps the weapon a lot. What we really want to talk about is not necessarily the extra paint or better movement though, but rather the very strong Burst Bomb combo that Grim Range has. Burst Bomb plus an indirect hit from the Range Blaster is a very strong and not too difficult kill combo that, while not killing quite as fast as a direct hit, allows for a faster and potentially more reliable kill option than two indirect hits, making a missed one shot not nearly as punishable from close range, and also allowing for more shot angles to be kills. Remember earlier on when blasters could do up to 125 damage on indirects? Well, they nerfed that a while ago, obviously, but unlike the later games, blasters could still do up to 80 damage with an indirect, and with burst bomb indirects dealing 25 to 35 damage, hitting a good range blaster shot was pretty much all you needed to make this combo work, which isn't even that hard to hit anyways. What really makes this combo special though is the gear ability damage up. Damage up not only increased the damage of the range blaster itself, but also the damage of the burst bomb, making this combo even more consistent while only having to invest at least a main ability of damage up to see the effects take shape. This might sound like a lot as you only get access to three main abilities on your gear, but running damage up was actually the meta for a large portion of this game's lifespan, and it really didn't bother Grim Range to be running one of the best gear abilities available and not even have to fully invest into it like other weapons such as the Splattershot Pro. Of course, Defense Up was also a gear ability in the game, meaning Grim Range Blaster wasn't always able to secure these super consistent combos, but you can still direct hit your burst bombs for 60 damage, which means any hit from the Range Blaster whatsoever will kill, so you still have an option to deal with full HP heavy Defense Up stackers. Of course, when Damage Up and Defense Up builds would begin to fall off in favor of Quick Respawn, Custom Range quickly became the choice over Grim, since Grim still has to run Damage Up when CRB doesn't, and CRB's kit is just better in general. Despite not being as used as its now godlike counterpart, Grim still maintained niches on certain maps like Camp Triggerfish and Arowana Mall for its kit, so it was still seen as a high tier with a fair amount of use even after the meta switched out of its favor. It ended off the game running similar gear to Custom Range Blaster, but with a little bit of damage up investment to help with the bomb combo. That's pretty much it for Range Blaster in Splatoon 1. The weapon was already decent, but the incredible kits it received are exactly what shot it straight to the top of the game. Range Blaster being as relevant as it was in both main eras of the game is super cool to see, and the dynamic between CRB and Grim is something we don't see very often in this game. Two different variants of the same main weapon saw different yet impactful bounce of relevance in very separate eras of the game, and they both did pretty much the same thing, meaning rather than one of them suffering nerfs that kicked it out of the meta, it would be the game changing entirely to decide which one was better. Also, Range Blaster does really well in this game outside of just being a top tier, as there wasn't much in the game that could deal with it super easily, with its only notable bad matchup being Cherry H3, and even then it's not too terrible of a matchup anyways. Range Blaster in Splatoon 1 was good, but it didn't stay that way for long. These would be the golden days of Range Blaster, and as we move into Splatoon 2, it's easy to see why. At the end of the first game, Range Blaster was incredibly strong, so just like many other Splatoon 1 top tiers, it would receive some nerfs going into Splatoon 2. These were not just some nerfs though. 
In fact, the nerfs given on Splatoon 2's release were some of the heaviest and most drastic nerfs in the game's history, and in the case of Range Blaster, the weapon would never be the same again. The weapon was given ink consumption, whiting frame, paint, and damage nerfs, which all massively affected it, but that's not even the worst of it all. In any video game, introducing randomness as a method of balancing is a terrible idea, and that's exactly what Nintendo did. Range Blaster was given much more impactful jump RNG mechanics than it previously had, making shots significantly harder to land, and because of range's longer range compared to other one-shot blasters, the deviation could be so bad that you could entirely miss shots that should have been a perfect direct all because you pressed the B button. This was terrible for Range Blaster, and you may think that's where the downsides end, but no, we haven't even gotten to this game's specials yet. Every special in Splatoon 2 was either reworked or just made new, and while it's not easy to say if this was an overall good thing, it was definitely bad for Range Blaster. Stingray was very oppressive for a long time, and that was pretty hard for range to deal with. It has no means of directly dealing with Bubble Blower or Booyah Bomb at all. It kinda struggled against Tenna Missiles, although pretty much everything does, but there was one special that was so good against range and all of the weapons like it, that Blasters became the worst weapon class in all of Splatoon 2, largely because of it. That's right, it's Ink Armor. I'm sure most of you know why Ink Armor pretty much ruined Blasters in this game, but for those of you who don't, Ink Armor is a globally chaining HP special that gives armor to your entire team. This armor can let you live one hit from literally anything. Bombs, charger shots, roller flicks, and yes, even blaster directs are no longer guaranteed one-shots. So on top of range blasters sometimes just missing because you jumped, landing a direct hit against an armored player doesn't even get you a one-shot. And with range blasters slower fire rate and heavy shot cooldown, it can be difficult to follow up on an armored direct for the kill. The existence of this special essentially means that Range Blaster can no longer reliably hit one-shots, which means that it can no longer reliably do its job. What's even worse is that Ink Armor was given to weapons like H3D, Junior, NZAP, and Kunder, meaning this special could be farmed incredibly hard and teams could basically have Ink Armor on command to deal with blasters. On top of this, all four of those armor weapons are meta-relevant or were in the past with Junior and NZAP being some of the best weapons in the entire game, and H3D still seeing a fair amount of use from dedicated players. However, Splatoon 2 wasn't always completely dominated by armor, so even if this sounds really, really bad for them, blasters and even range did still have a chance. The vanilla range blaster actually wasn't available on Splatoon 2's launch, being put in the game on October 20th, 2017, which was just a little bit after patch 1.4.0. Vanilla Range comes with Suction Bomb and Ink Storm, and despite how lackluster this kit sounds, it might have actually been pretty good. Suction Bomb isn't great for it since the bomb is so slow, but with the delayed explosion allowing for spaces to be threatened for longer combined with its large blast radius, it was definitely still possible to get value out of it. The main attraction of this kit, however, would actually be the special, which is Ink Storm. At the time Range Blaster was released, Ink Storm was actually a significantly stronger special than it is today, and Range at the time had 180p Ink Storm, so its output was pretty good. The two other main Ink Storm threats in the game at the time were Splattershot Pro, which is kind of irrelevant, and Splatbrella, which was a pretty overtuned and insanely strong weapon at the time. Because it seemed good against Brella, had Ink Storm, and plenty of people already knew how to play it from Splatoon 1, range would begin to see use for a good amount of time. But at the same time Brella was good, so was Burst Bomb Spam, and that would prove to be sorta of difficult for range to deal with. Not necessarily because of the Burst Bomb Spam itself, although it was an issue, but it would actually prove difficult for range to deal with the two weapons used for spamming Burst Bombs, Splattershot with Burst Bomb and Splashdown, and tri with Burst Bomb and Ink Armor. Although tri was nerfed in this patch, it having Ink Armor really threatening AoE and the freedom to run a pure of Subsaver for triple burst made it a pretty scary pick against Range Blaster. Splattershot could also run enough Subsaver for triple burst, but Splashdown should hold it back, right? Well, hitting players in Splashdown was based on internet connection quality back then, meaning you couldn't cancel Splashdowns until a later patch when this was fixed. Range can't really move all that well, so it just kinda dies to Splashdown if it's close to it and can't cancel it. Also, the whole reason these weapons were used as burst bomb spammers was because they could throw three burst bombs, pop special, and throw three more burst bombs right after, essentially creating a pseudo bomb rush which was super hard for range to deal with. Vanilla Range Blaster wouldn't see much use outside of this short period of time after its release because even after the subsaber nerf which would cause burst bomb spam to fall off, 
Forge Splattershot Pro and its Bubble Blower would become super prominent, and NZAP with Ink Armor was ran to counter Bubble Blower. So Range Blaster wouldn't really be able to fit itself anywhere when two specials it struggles a lot against were defining the meta. Also, in that same patch as well as the following one, Range Blaster would get points for special nerfs, and Ink Storm itself would also be nerfed. So there was pretty much no reason to use this thing then, and there really isn't now. Also, the normal blaster would receive quite a few hefty buffs soon, and that would pretty much be the final nail in the coffin for this thing. Just like last game, Comeback, Quick Respawn, and Stealth Jump were the norm for gear abilities. It didn't really need anything outside of that, although a little bit of subsaver could be ran for a third shot after throwing a suction bomb. Next is the return of the Custom Range Blaster, which comes with Curling Bomb and Bubble Blower, and unlike its Splatoon 1 counterpart, this thing was doomed from the start. This weapon has access to the best special in the game and its insanely powerful bubble combo, but there's just no point in using it whatsoever. Sure, you could argue that the AoE it has can help in some scenarios, and maybe the Curling Bomb is good in a few niche cases, but that doesn't matter when you're directly competing with top tiers in the best weapon class that do the same job better. We've already mentioned the reason this thing saw zero use, and it's because of the Forge Splattershot Pro, which comes with Suction Bomb and Bubble Blower, enabling a much easier and more consistent combo. CRB is directly outclassed by Forge, which would later become directly outclassed by Foil Squeezer, making Custom Range Blaster one of the only weapons ever to be directly outclassed twice. Sadly, there is not much history to cover with this weapon because it was just not played. The best I can do is tell you how bad it is. Finally, we can talk about the Grim Range Blaster. Equipped with Burst Bomb and Tena Missiles, this was easily the best Range Blaster in Splatoon 2, and for good reason. Burst Bomb returning on range gave it the Burst Bomb combo back, which was obviously super helpful for it, and its special was great for it too. Tena Missiles provide good chip damage, a means of removing ink armor, instant location of the entire enemy team, and a way to keep streaks or continue moving. And for a weapon with range's playstyle, there's no doubt this was great for it possibly the best special it could have gotten. Being able to temporarily back out, pop missiles, know where everybody is, and then re-engage with an advantage was pretty much perfect for Range Blaster. However, there are still many downsides to this kit. Things like Range Blaster's damage being lower, bomb defense up DX being practically necessary, and damage up no longer existing make the burst bomb combo much harder. And while it was given good options to deal with ink armor, it doesn't always have those options available due to poor special output and heavy ink consumption. Outside of the issues of being a range blaster, this weapon was pretty good. For the first time in a while, a range blaster started to become an actual option people were considering. It was never really in the meta, sort of just a weapon in the game, and it barely got any high or top level rep with pretty much only one player pushing it competitively in the western scene. However, it was extremely popular in solo queue, consistently placing within the top 10 or 15 most used weapons in X rank, even in Splatoon's endgame. Outside of the western scene, there is also one incredibly strong notable Japanese rep for Grim Range Blaster named Shiominto. They were an extremely dominant Grim Range player, consistently hitting X powers in the 2900 range in Splatoon 2, consistently being the highest X power Grim player and subsequently the highest X power blaster in general, and even top 4 in Area Cup, which is a very stacked zones-only Japanese tournament, multiple times in Splatoon 2's endgame. And if you know anything about Splatoon 2's post-patch meta, it was a pretty rough time for the Blaster class. This player got some of, if not the best and most impressive competitive results out of any Range Blaster player in Splatoon 2. And while there isn't too much competition at that level, considering barely anybody plays the weapon, it's still extremely impressive to do that in a zones-only tourney against the best in the world with a weapon like Grim. However, as you may have noticed, Shiomito is running Grim range with Seajet, Kgal, and Enzap, three of the best weapons in the game, and this is because of Range Blaster's heavy dependence on its team, which is a concept I haven't explained yet. Range Blaster has super exploitable weaknesses due to the harsh nerfs it was given, but in exchange has very good strengths, and in order for those strengths to be a factor, you have to build a team around Range Blaster. Whether this be just running three other top tiers to make up for it, or directly running weapons that enable it, Range Blaster requires an abnormal degree of team building to make it work, which is a large reason why it's so uncommon at top level play, even with a kit like Grim. As for gear, Grim runs Comeback, Quick Respawn, and Stealth Jump, as per usual, but it would occasionally run a bit of subsaver for an extra shot after Burst Bombs. That's about it though, it wasn't really anything special in terms of gear, as Vanilla Range pretty much ran the same things. Now it's time to get into the changes to Range Blaster, or should I say, the lack thereof. It's gotten absolutely zero multiplayer balance changes outside of points for special, which didn't really do anything positive, and the main weapon is essentially in the same state it was in at the start of the game. 
It's absolutely crazy that they didn't touch this thing once for the whole five years this game was out, and it's almost like they completely forgot about it despite how poor of a state it was in. By the way, all the other blasters received buffs, and Luna Blaster, which is in an arguably worse spot than Range Blaster is, received only buffs after release. Also, other blasters, specifically Custom Blaster, all three of the Rapids and Rapid Pro Deco, saw some sort of presence in the metagame despite being in the worst weapon class, but they didn't even bother giving Range Blaster a chance. Maybe something would change with the next game, and maybe Nintendo would actually pay attention to it. Trailers for Splatoon 3 rolled around, and Range Blaster was a huge feature in many of them with a completely new and unique design. With this new design, it was expected that Range Blaster would receive some sort of change, and while it didn't get anything directly, the game changing as a whole suddenly pushed this thing into a new light. With the removal of main power up from the game, Intensify Action Up was introduced as a new gear ability that would both buff the new movement options, being Squid Roll and Squid Surge, and decrease jump RNG for any weapon affected by it, which was huge for blasters. This time, unlike MPU, the effectiveness curve of Intensify Action was actually reasonable and made a notable difference in the jump RNG, which, again, was huge. It wasn't all perfect though, as the Blaster class gets a worse curve for Intensify than other weapons in the game, meaning you have to run more of it to see the effect take shape if you're using a Blaster. In Range Blaster's case, which is a weapon that likes to run a lot of quick respawn, it can't fit too much of the gear ability without sacrificing on its respawn timer, so it's usually best to run two subs to a main worth of Intensify to get a good enough effect while not taking too much space on your gear. While Intensify action wouldn't necessarily be the savior of the weapon like people initially thought, Splatoon 3 still put Range Blaster in a much, much better spot. The number one thing helping this weapon out would be the new pool of specials, but more specifically the removal of Ink Armor, which, as we know, is the Blaster class's biggest counter. Now it can't get bullshitted out of kills anymore, and it can actually do its job confidently knowing that every shot it lands will deal damage, and every direct it lands will kill. This is huge for Blasters in general, because now their kill and combo potential is much higher, which we will see with the first range kit. So far, the weapon only has one kit, but luckily for range players, it's actually pretty good. With the kit of Suction Bomb and Wavebreaker, Splatoon 3's vanilla range blaster fits into a sort of unique, special dependent playstyle that isn't commonly seen. This weapon on its own isn't anything too crazy, but once it gets Wavebreaker off, it quickly becomes one of the scariest weapons in the entire game. Range Blaster's combo with Wavebreaker is insanely strong and really consistent, and without the presence of things like Ink Armor to completely invalidate your Blaster shots, there's pretty much nothing stopping Range Blaster from going rampant once it gets Wave off. There are some very large issues with this, however. The Wavebreaker combo is, of course, entirely dependent on Wavebreaker, and Range Blaster isn't exactly known for getting its special out quickly, especially with this kit's 200p, which is way too high of a points for special number for this weapon to have. After you get your Wavebreaker off, which is a rarity on its own, the Wavebreaker actually needs to hit, which when put against good players who can listen for Wavebreaker, it's kinda hard to land a Wavebreaker hit. This is one of the only things that Range Blaster does super well at this point, as it arguably has better synergy than any other Wavebreaker weapon in the game right now. For a really long time, Sloshing Machine and Range Blaster were the only two AoE weapons that were considered, and obviously, Machine was much, much better almost everywhere, which led to Range Blaster not seeing much use. That doesn't mean Range wasn't good though, as it was probably the best Blaster weapon until the Sizzle Season dropped. In the same update Machine was nerfed to no longer be a contender for the best weapon in the game, the S-Blast 92 released, and initially this looked pretty bad for Range Blaster. S-Blast is an absurdly good main weapon which fixes a lot of the weaknesses that Range Blaster has, such as jump RNG and need for intensify action. While S-Blast as a main weapon is truly absurd, it has its weaknesses, mainly the kit of Sprinkler and Reef Slider and a very tiny blast radius on the long range mode. Range Blaster, on the other hand, has a really good kit with a lethal bomb and great synergy with it as well as Big Blast Radius on its shots, which S-Blast just doesn't have at the same range. This Big Blast Radius can be super nice for certain map modes, and the great synergy with Wavebreaker gives range a pretty strong niche. Right now, if you play S-Blast, I recommend you should also play Range Blaster and vice versa. With Range's kit having certain utility over S-Blast, it's definitely something worth investing into. At the time this video releases, we are in version 5.0 of Splatoon 3, and this is the best place Range Blaster has been in since the end of Splatoon 1. We aren't too far into the patch, so tier list placements are still sort of up in the air, but we are sure about one thing. Trizuka and Tacticooler are both really, really good. This is pretty obviously an incredible meta for Range Blaster to be in. Zuka and Range have really good synergy, now with Zuka's 60 damage indirects guaranteeing a combo, and Tacticooler is amazing for weapons like Range. As we know, Range Blaster struggles with mobility and jump RNG, and thanks to Tacticooler and the abilities it gives you when you pick it up, these things are a non-factor. 
And, of course, it gives you max quick respawn and special saver, which is so good for a weapon that dies a lot and struggles with getting its special up. Splatoon 3 Range Blaster isn't too remarkable on its own, as per usual, but building a team which enables it can turn it into one of the best weapons out there, and it just so happens that the weapons which enable it are also the best weapons in the game. It's pretty safe to say that Range is the best blaster right now, beating out S-Blast by a significant margin. Still, if you play Range Blaster, you should also be using S-Blast for the reasons I mentioned earlier. That should be it for the weapon's history so far, but since all three kits haven't been released, we get to talk about its potential future, too. Grim Range Blaster will most likely get Burst Bomb again, but what worries me is the amount of nerfs given to Burst Bomb in this game, severely affecting Range Blaster's combo with it. Burst Bombs now have reduced blast radius, increased whiting frames, increased ink consumption, and, of course, more resistance by sub-defense up. As we go on, it becomes harder and harder to play to Grimm's strengths, and who knows, Burst Bomb might be nerfed even more in the future, with Splash still being one of the best weapons in the game, and if Nintendo doesn't handle it properly, Grimm could possibly struggle a lot more than it should. On the other hand, a very large amount of the Splatoon community has been campaigning for Custom Range Blaster to get Splat Bomb and Kraken Royale, as a cool reference to Splatoon 1 CRB. I can totally see Nintendo doing this, as it seems like they're sort of catering to the Range Blaster fans with its new design and all, and this would be a pretty good kit for the weapon as we've seen in the past. Especially now that S-Blast exists, giving Range Blaster a Splat Bomb to cover for its lack of a short-range firing mode would be great for it. And although Splatoon 3's rendition of Kraken is much worse than it was in Splatoon 1, it would still be a great tool for the weapon as a whole. That should be it for the history of the Range Blaster so far. While it may not be nearly as good as it was in Splatoon 1, it seems like it's only up from here, with its place on many tier lists continuing to rise with every update. If this game continues to develop the way it has, we might just see a top tier Range Blaster for the first time in 6 years, although I kinda doubt that'll happen. If this video has inspired you in any way to check out Range Blaster for yourself, the largest competitive Splatoon content creator, Prochara, happens to main the weapon and has many, many hours of footage in all three games for you to watch and learn from. Additionally, you can check the description to see who supplied all the footage I used in this video, and find even more there. I'm sure many of you noticed, but it's been two months since my last upload, and that is largely because I've been streaming on Twitch. I've dumped almost 300 hours over there, and the small community that's formed on that platform would love to see more of you stop by. They've also inspired me to make a Discord server, which will release publicly when this channel hits 5,000 subscribers. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you in three months this time.